Well, good morning again, church. I pray you can hear me okay. Give me a little wave if you can hear me all right. Um, I, uh, I found that moving into this new mode of worship on Zoom gave me some energy. Uh, I feel like um, uh, preaching in this way where I can actually see some of your faces gives me uh, more energy than preaching just to my camera and then putting it up as a video. Um, but I've also noticed in the last few weeks as we've, uh, as we've continued this that seeing your faces makes me then long for yet more. Uh, long to be with you, long to hear your voices, long to be our community in one place together. Uh, alas, we, we continue uh, our journey through the wilderness. Uh, it's a journey that we take in part to be um, careful and loving toward one another. Uh, it is an act of care uh, to meet uh, in this way. Um, and so just please know that... Uh, uh, if I could, if the situation were right, I would reach out and I would I would hold you uh, and ask how you were doing, um, and I know you would do the same for me. Uh, if you're like me, you're 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 grasping for meaning in this strange wilderness time, uh, grasping for um, models of how to interpret life in a space like this. And uh, this past week, I knew I was uh, preparing for a sermon that would be on American Indian Ministry Sunday. And so I, um, I uh, took a recommendation from somebody whose recommendations I trust. And um, the latest book that I finished is called The Four Vision Quests of Jesus. And it is by an Episcopal bishop who is also a member of the Choctaw Nation and his name is Stephen Charleston, and I strongly recommend it. It's, it is a, not too long, and it is a, a beautiful uh, reflection by somebody who was challenged, wondering, can I, within my own life, hold together my own Native identity alongside my Christian identity? And Stephen Charleston eventually concludes that he can. Uh, but maybe not in the way that you would have imagined or that I would have imagined. Charleston uses the frame in this book of the vision quest, We're talking about the vision quest as uh, a largely uh, universal practice within uh, indigenous communities uh, on this continent. And he describes the, the vision quest uh, in some ways that were revealing to me. I had not thought of them this way before. One thing that he says that I think is important for us as a, as a, as a people is that um, often when we think about a vision quest or even about Jesus' ministry, which Charleston wants to say these two things are related, uh, we think of it as some kind of special person having a special experience. Uh, and he says the vision quest in the native imagination is something that anyone can experience. And in some sense, everyone should seek and uh, not reserved just for the few, not just reserved for so-called holy people. The vision quest is a practice that the people uh, can choose to go on. It is both an individual quest, but it can also be seen as a common quest that people take on together. So I want to suggest in this sermon to you that um, in a certain sense, we can learn uh, from Stephen Charleston and from other Native people um, to frame our wilderness time as a sort of vision quest. Uh, not that we're trying to be uh, Native people if we're not, um, but that we are um, trying to walk through this wilderness time with some intention. And Charleston says there are different aspects to the, to the vision quest. The first aspect uh, is an aspect of preparation. I don't know uh, whether we had much time to prepare for the situation that we are in now, but we know in the story that we read today that the Israelites took some time of preparation. That's what the plagues were about. That's what the, the uh, preparing the Passover feast was about. There was a time of preparation for uh, crossing over and into this new space. The second part of the uh, aspect of the vision quest is 
uh, a sense of solitude a sense of aloneness, of being cut off from the usual resources that we are used to having. I think this might speak directly into our experience. Uh, I, I've spoken with many of you and I know you experience what I experienced that this time doesn't feel normal. It feels like a, a set aside kind of time, a time when you're not able to rely on the same routines and people and resources that you may have been able to rely on before. Finally, in the, not finally, but next in the vision quest, there is a sense of the support of certain people around us that we can rely on. In other words, the time of the vision quest, yes, there is a sense of solitude and being set apart, but you're not all on your own. Uh, there are people around you. And so uh, we, as the community of the church and the networks beyond the church, we have certain people who are encouraging us, who are reminding us that they are here and they, they support us in what we are walking through. And we provide that same support for other people. In many versions of the Native American vision quest, there are uh, companions that go out with the person who is on the vision quest um, and are there as a supportive presence, even as the person has an experience all on their own. And then there is a sense in the vision quest that the, the person in their solitude and supported, having done the preparation, goes up to a high and holy place. And I'm gonna to get to that later in the sermon, but the idea is to go to a place where you have a vantage point where there is an opportunity to, to glimpse a new kind of broad vision, to get out of the, the narrow space that you are in and to have a sense of the landscape uh, before you. And Charleston says that Jesus' first vision quest was of course his sojourn in the wilderness. And during that sojourn, he is brought up to a high place where he is able to get uh, an ample perspective of the world around him and he too is granted a vision. So I wanna think about how this sojourn in the wilderness for the Israelites might be a collective vision quest for the people of Israel and how that might inform our understanding of our walking through uh, this wilderness with thanks to the perspective of Charleston and other native people who encourage uh, everyone and anyone seeking to know, uh, um, seeking to draw close to God for a vision, what that resource might look like. So here in our story, we have yet another complaining story. Do you remember last week there was complaining? What were they complaining about last week? They were hungry. They wanted food. They wanted some bread. And they started complaining in the wilderness. I think we can all understand this kind of uh, complaining. Here, uh, this week, it almost takes on another extra edge. Here, uh, they've come into a new place, and um, presumably there's still manna around, but as Pastor Lacey has mentioned already today, there is no water. The people are thirsty. It is a dry and barren place. And I think it's pretty reasonable that they would complain. But it has this extra edge. They go to Moses, and they say, well, what are you doing to us? Did You took us all the way out here. You had us cross over this treacherous sea. We could have drowned in, and then we got to the other side. We don't know our way around. We almost starved to death, and now we're here, and there is no water anywhere, and not only we, but all of our livestock are going to die of thirst. What are you thinking? And Moses, I don't know, and I imagine his face. I've felt this sometimes. It's this look. And where does Moses go? Moses goes and has a talk with God. And in this talk with God, here's the extra little detail. God says, I think they're going to kill me. Like if they don't have water, they're going to pick up stones and they're going to throw them at me. They are, they are that upset. And God, in response, has a plan. Moses, look in your hand. What's there? The same staff. The same staff you had at the very beginning. The same staff that parted the seas. The same staff that, uh, that has led the people all this way. Just take that staff and, and go up to the rock and strike the rock. 
and water will come forth. I was thinking about this notion of uh, complaining and, 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 and how I, I can understand the complaints, but I'm also wondering if there is a deeper sense of complaint in this story, a deeper sense of complaint, which I will call lament. Complaint in our own language has a sense of there's some kind of discomfort and I, I don't like it. And so I'm going to go to the nearest person. And I'm going to complain to them and have them fix it. But lament is a, is a deeper expression. Lament comes from that, that deep place of longing and of grief and of loss and of bewilderment. And I wonder if in this time of wandering in the wilderness, if you can feel sometimes that oscillation between complaint and lament in your own reaction to things. Uh, I'm upset when I have to wait extra long to be led into Trader Joe's. Is that a complaint or a lament? I'd put that on the side of complaint. <laughs> it could be better. Nothing anybody can do about it. It's kind of the situation right now. But on the side of lament, I can smell smoke in the air again. I'm aware of people who are not just feeling lonely, but bereft of friendship in this time of solitude. I look around me at our political landscape, and I look at um, the violence that is perpetrated, especially toward people of color. And that's not just a complaint about discomfort. That, that comes from a deeper place and a deeper longing. Can you feel that? And, and there's kind of, I suppose, a middle space in between them. But, but when you're complaining about something that is a discomfort and when you're lamenting about something that is a deep source of pain and grief and loss, it's, it's a bit different. I wonder, I wonder where this is on the scale of things. I, I, wonder, I wonder how God hears the people's complaint if it rises up as lament. I don't know, but I do know this, that God has no judgment in this episode. As soon as God hears what Moses has to say, God is like, all right, here we go. Here's the next thing. Moses, take your staff, strike the rock. Here comes the water. The people need water to live. And so this is how we're going to do it. And it's not just anything that they are longing for. It is the very stuff of life. Out of the experience of uh, standing Rock, we heard more and more of this expression that water is life. It was, it's such a basic, obvious truth. And yet it is something that we so often want to deny. That we are mostly water beings. <laughs> that water is the stuff that keeps things alive on earth. And that water must be uh, protected in order to provide life for all, that water is not just a commodity that can be bottled and sold. In fact, when we do that, we undercut the real nature of water, which is that it is sacred. And access to clean, healthy water is something we are obligated to provide to all of our neighbors. Water protectors is what many Native people have called themselves not just advocates, but those who are called by God to be protectors of the very water that keeps not just uh, one community alive, but all of the life on the planet. And so when the people of Israel are asking for water, they are not asking for some kind of trivial thing that has provided an inconvenience. They are asking for the very stuff of life. So I think when they are asking for water, they are, at, they are lifting up a lament. A lament that the very stuff of life seems to be lacking. I think it's no mistake that in Jesus' ministry, there are all kinds of echoes of this Exodus experience. When Jesus meets with a Samaritan woman at the well, he asks her for water. And then he describes himself as living water. The woman at the well has a vision of living water that gives all kinds of 
life. And Jesus describes him as the very embodiment of this water. He is living water itself. I wondered as I looked at this text uh, in preparation for this week, if indeed this is a, uh, could be seen through the frame of a vision quest, where is the high and holy place? Well, I want to bring out one word from the text, and the word is Meribah. You know, Meribah means uh, quarrel. They named the place, the, the place where the people quarreled with God. Uh, Quarrel, the word can also be described as, um, as an adversary. And so in the memory of Israel, there are kind of two different memories. One place is, this is this place where God provided this abundance of water that kept the people alive. But also in the memory of Israel, they remember that this is the place where the people treated God as an adversary. There's a kind of a dual edge to it. And the dual edge, the, the adversary part, is a bit of a judgment. It is, there was a time when the people forgot that God is the source of life. And instead, they were going to treat God as the adversary. And if you read closely to the text, which I didn't do until just recently, you realize that the people in this episode are being led from one place to another. Right before the manna episode, there is a very brief verse at the end of chapter 15 that reads this. It says, you might have missed it. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they camped there by the water. That's all it says. The people were camped right by water. They didn't do anything. They didn't say anything. Nothing, nothing else was remembered about it. Next episode, we're starving. We're going to die. God provides manna. Next episode, we're thirsty. We need water. We're going to die. And now God, in response, refusing to act as adversary, but only as source of blessing, leads them forward, says, I'm going to go out ahead of you, and there I will be at the rock. And it's not just any rock. Did you hear where the rock is? It is the rock of Horeb. Did you miss it? The rock of Sinai. Sinai and Horeb are the same thing. It is a mountain. It is the mountain where God is about to give them the covenant of neighborliness. At the foot of that mountain, of the rock of that mountain, that is where God is going to have Moses put his staff in the rock so that water can flow out, so that life can flow out. God is leading on ahead of us, not as adversary, but as source of blessing. The source of blessing will be water to keep the people and all of the animals alive, and the source of blessing will be the covenant of neighborliness. As I reflected on this Sunday and on the experiences that I have had with Native people, either in person or in reading, I realize that what Native people have to offer those of us who are not Native is a covenant of neighborliness that is not unknown to us, but that we very often forget when we make water into a commodity and forget that it is gift and the very source of our life. So on this vision quest that we're on, if, if that is a helpful frame, let us prepare ourselves. Let us prepare ourselves to be in a time of holy isolation where things are different. Let us draw close to us those people that we know can be our supports and let us be led to that high and holy place where the blessing of life is given as is the covenant of neighborliness, the reminder that we belong to God and that we would belong to one another. May it be so. Amen.